Ladies, gentlemen, I want to share something with you. If you're going through bankruptcy and you're going through foreclosure, the one thing, your best ammunition, is to challenge the validity of the debt. The Fair Debt Collections Practices Act and bankruptcy go hand in hand. So if you do your challenge, you don't have to do it, the initial challenge under the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, you can do it in bankruptcy because when they file their proof of claim, that's an initial claim. That's an initial notice. So you can challenge the validity of their claim as being a creditor. The bankruptcy court must hold an evidentiary hearing where evidence has to be presented. They can't just use their words. Testimony has to be heard. And you're challenging the debt. You're saying that you did not get a loan from the bank. Now, let's prove that you didn't get a loan. First, when it's delivered to the local Federal Reserve agent, your promissory note is not a promissory note anymore. We'll talk about that in a second. I'll prove it to you in a moment. I haven't even asked the question yet, but now that I'm doing this video, I'm going to ask the question. Your promissory note is not a normal promissory note. They still call it a promissory note. That's done to, to throw you off. That's making you think you made a promise to pay. Stop believing that your promissory note when delivered to a local Federal Reserve agent is a promissory note where you've given a promise to pay. It is a security. That's why it's called collateral security. You are delivering a security to the bank. The bank is purchasing your security. That's how the other person, the seller, gets paid. It's with the purchase of the security. Pay attention, people. There is no funding. They can't prove they funded your loan. Guess what the banks cannot do? The banks cannot use fractional reserve banking to fund your loan. See, the courts be saying this thing about vapor money, creating it out of thin air. Well, fractional reserve banking is the creating money out of thin air. They bring up vapor money in your case like they did in these people's case that I'm helping right now. You bring up the fact that, oh, no, there is vapor money. The banks have told us, yeah, modern money mechanics. That's by the Chicago uh, Federal Reserve Bank. You better believe it. And that bank said they, they create money out of thin air. They call it fractional reserve banking. Your, your, your highness, I mean, your honor, I mean, uh, moron. Okay, that's how you kill all that noise. Fractional reserve banking is creating money out of thin air. The banks get to fractional reserve. There is no law allowing it. They created it upon their books. That's what Credit River was all about. I know about the raising of an evidentiary hearing and the fact that you have to do it before, if you're in a criminal case, you have to do it before jury selection. If you're in a regular civil case, you just do it right off the bat. Demand an evidentiary hearing. The courts are not going to give you an evidentiary hearing. They're used to saying no. That's an appealable matter. On appeal, that's what you appeal on. Always demand an evidentiary hearing. Prove your case. Prove your standing. Now, hold on. When you challenge the debt, that is a jurisdictional matter because the court has no jurisdiction if there is no debt. So it's a jurisdictional matter. So that's a challenge to jurisdiction. So all you got to do is highlight that this is a jurisdictional challenge. They have to prove the debt. They're the debtor. Now, you guys know that the burden is on the person bringing the claim. Okay, so how come the courts do not put the burden on the banks? They put it on you. You have to take that burden. That's the hot potato. And you have to throw that burden back on them. Oh, no, I ain't got to prove nothing. They're the ones who have to prove standing. Where's the proof of their standing? Oh, no, no, shut up. You don't get to determine whether or not they have standing. The law determines whether or not they have standing. What you talking about? It's your opinion. F your opinion. No, I'm saying that respectfully when you sit up here and say something stupid like that. How dare you sit up here and tell me that you go make a determination? Well, look, I'll tell you what you can do with your determination. Mother, <clears throat> excuse me. I apologize. Oh, you don't think so, huh? That's exactly the way I talk. I don't give them anything more than what they deserve. I'm required. The God I serve requires me to respect them. But when they step outside that respective role, then they get treated like everybody else. Okay? Just the way it is. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to do two things for you. We're going to do that question in a moment, but we're about to do two things. Under law, let's do this one right here. Uh-oh, I don't have it no more. Oh, did I did I shut it down? Oh, God, dude, I shut it down. Shut him down. Shut him, shut him down. I shut him down. Hold on one second. We'll be right back. Not there. I said pause. Hold all right, I want y'all to pay attention to this. I'm just going to let it play. Let it play. Let it play. Understood. Uh-oh. Here is the specific Hold process on. for fun. Hold on. Not there. We got to go here. Hold on. We're supposed to be right here. Right, right here. Get out of the way. And I got to make sure y'all can hear it. So give me a second. Because I can hear it, but sometimes it don't be playing fair. Okay, so give me a second. We're going to play right now. Involuntary bankruptcy yeah, is governed by Chapter that. 11 of the U.S. Bankruptcy Code, We're bring specifically down 11 U.S.C. 303. Here are the key points relevant to filing an involuntary bankruptcy petition against an entity like the Federal Reserve. Eligibility to file an involuntary petition. Under 11 U.S.C. 303, a, an involuntary bankruptcy petition may be filed by creditors holding claims against the debtor that are not contingent as to liability or the subject of a bona fide dispute. Number Hold of on petitioning now. creditors. If the debtor has 12 or more creditors, at least three creditors must join. Hold on now. Let me make sure you all understand. The Federal Reserve, hold on so that, so that you all get it, because some of you all are not going to understand this until I do this. The Federal Reserve is not part of the United States. These are all cases dealing with the fact that the Federal Reserve Bank is not government. Now, hold on now. That means that if you have a claim against them, such as foreclosing on your home, not accepting your promissory note as a security, but accepting it as a security and claiming it with something else and then foreclosing your home and trading it on the market. That's why they trade your notes on the market because they're securities people. It's called the securities and exchange. <laughs> okay, they're securities. You're exchanging a security with the bank. Come on now, pay attention. You might miss something. So because your promissory note is security and the Federal Reserve is not, pay attention. A government agency they can be taken to bankruptcy court on an involuntary bankruptcy we can't do it those who are part of the lawsuit you can't do it because we're going after the federal reserve in the lawsuit they've been served as of today well as of tomorrow sorry i said as of today this is a holiday they've been served as of tomorrow okay finally yay and because they've been served and I got to send the proof of service once I receive it back from the Postal Service signature request receipt. Once they've been served, trust me, you guys cannot bring a claim in bankruptcy court. Okay? It is not permitted. But those who are not part of the suit, you get 12 people, you bring up the correct arguments, and you can take them to bankruptcy court and get paid. Look, those of you who are... Signing up for the new program. I got to step in and say this just real quick. Do not email me or text me about any company business. I, I am so sick and tired of telling people I cannot discuss company business over my private lines, private emails. We have a company. You have to go through that process. They will only tell you the same thing that's on the website. So if you don't see it on the website, you got some research you need to do. It's not our job to do the research for you. If you don't understand, then don't buy the product. It's not for you. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I have to say that because so many people are buying things just because they, they need to buy something because they need to spend money. This program is too important to have those type of people involved. I'm being honest and I'm being serious. This program is designed, pay attention, for you to gain control of the securities held in your minor account. We're going after the estate. You're coming in as the representative of the estate so that you have total control, and you're going to come in under your natural capacity as a creditor. Pay attention. Remember, you're filing bankruptcy on behalf of the debtor. That's a corporation. It's the infant estate, but you're also going to file a proof of claim as a creditor. Don't don't, don't even imagine that I don't know where I'm headed with this. Don't even imagine that I haven't already thought this stuff out. 
I promise with every fiber in me and all of the knowledge that I do have that I cannot think of a better way for you to gain control of the securities held in your minor account since chapter 11 puts you in the control of everything. It makes you the debtor in possession. They're telling you, pay attention. They're telling you what you need to do. They gave you a corporation and they make you a debtor in possession when you file under chapter 11. And they don't tell you, you can't do that. You can't file under chapter 11. I already got people who did it since I put out the video in 2012. We're full circle. Okay, apologize for that. Small segment. Now, let's ask a question. I got to try to remember the question because I forgot it. I was going to ask it, and it's about promissory notes. Hold on. Let's do ChatGPT. No, we can't do that, ChatGPT, because that one don't like me. Hold on. We, 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 Okay, give me this chat GPT. We're going to open up a new one. Oh, as I told you, chat GPT is really a piece of junk. I only use it because I can get certain answers and show to you. But chat GPT, it's too much work. They, they've trained it to lie too often. And so it literally, even when I, wait, hold on. Let's see. Bankruptcy court. I think this one is it. Give me one second. No, it's the other one. Give me a second. We're going to go here. I need to find the one. It's ChatGPT who told me that the Federal Reserve is part of the uh, United States. Literally. He said the Federal Reserve is a federal agency. Wait, I think that's it. Give me one second. I think this is uh, the document that we were looking at. Which one? It should be the last one. I think this is the one where he was saying that the Federal Reserve is a United States part of the federal government. The Federal Reserve, as part of the federal government, may not be subject to involuntary bankruptcy. Now, pay attention. I had to go back in there and tell that idiot, give me 10 cases that show that the Federal Reserve is not part of the federal government. The court held that the Federal Reserve Bank is not a federal agency under the Federal uh, Freedom of Information Act. Actually, hold on. Yes, they are. Because that's why I did the FOIA request. Pay attention. They don't need to be a federal agency. They just need to be an agency under the Freedom of Information Act. And they have a Freedom of Information Act section on their website. Ta-da! Anyway, hold on. The court indicated the Federal Reserve Bank, while created under federal law, do not have the status of federal agencies for the purpose such as sovereign immunity. They don't have sovereign immunity. But remember, ChatGPT has been trained to tell you guys that they do have sovereign immunity. And there might be sovereign immunity issues. Now, he says might. Pay attention. He says might. But if they don't have sovereign immunity, why would they might be? Again, they've trained it to lie to you. That's why I say I don't ask questions I don't already have the answers to. So let's go ahead and ask our question. If y'all don't mind, we're going to go back to the online version. Okay, watch this. We're going to do a new one. Okay, I'm going to rip this one a new one. Get over here. Sit down and shut up. Sorry, I apologize. I got to go out and play with the dogs in a minute. They need the, the camaraderie. I, I do that. I spend time with my doggies every single day. We have a routine. I wake up. First thing I do is I go out and see the doggies. And if I miss that, they make sure that I go out and see them. Even if I'm getting ready to leave, I go out and I see the doggies. I don't just walk away from them and just be going about my business. Okay, we've been dealing with it because it's 115 degrees out there today. It's still, what is it, uh, 93 degrees at 8 o'clock? Lord have mercy. Oh, no. See, I don't have a problem with heat. I have a problem with no circulation. So right now, inside, it is 91 degrees. There's no fan blowing. I have a window open, and I'm getting the circulation there, and the front door is open. I don't need cold air because I can't adjust my temperature like the rest of you. So I'm okay at 91 degrees. It gets 101 in here. Uh, no, I don't want that. I don't want to be at 101 degrees inside. I'll be at 101 degrees outside. I don't have no problem as long as I'm hydrated. But no, we ain't having that, not on the inside. So if it was that, the fan and the swamp cooler and the air conditioners would be on. 
All right, enough about that. Let's talk about this. Wake up. Wake up. Did you know that a promissory note, when delivered to the local Federal Reserve agent under the Federal Reserve Act, Section 16, open paren, numero 2, close paren, comma, open paren, numero 4, close paren, is not a promise to pay, but a financial instrument or a security or collateral? Question mark. Stop listening. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to let that play for y'all so y'all can hear it for yourselves. Stop yes, letting them tell you it's a promissory note. Of the Federal Reserve Act, promissory notes, when delivered to the Federal Reserve, can indeed be treated as financial instruments or collateral rather than mere promises to pay. This is part of the broader framework allowing the Federal Reserve to issue Federal Reserve notes backed by various forms of collateral, including commercial paper, notes, drafts, and other financial instruments. This provision enables the Federal Reserve to maintain liquidity and support the stability of the financial system. Oops. Here's a brief overview of the relevant sections. Section 16.2. This section outlines the issuance of Federal Reserve notes and the types of collateral that can back them, including gold, commercial paper, and other acceptable financial instruments. Section 16.4. This section specifies the conditions under which the Federal Reserve can issue notes and the requirements for securing them, highlighting that these notes must be backed by eligible collateral. This legal framework helps ensure that Federal Reserve notes are backed by tangible assets, thereby supporting their value and trust in the financial system. Excuse me one second, ladies and gentlemen. Wake up, you idiot. The subject matter was promissory notes, not Federal Reserve notes. Now re-answer my question and give me seven case citations that evidence the courts recognizing the financial instrument capacity of promissory notes when in compliance with the Federal Reserve Act, Section 16, exclamation mark. Stop listening. Now, you saw how he talked about Federal Reserve notes. The conversation wasn't about Federal Reserve notes. Now, although he did identify promissory notes as being financial instruments, we're going to deal with the case citations that talk about this. Here are seven cases that recognize promissory notes as financial instruments in compliance with Section 16 of the Federal Reserve Act. Ladies and gentlemen, stop letting them tell you that your promissory note was a promise to pay. Your promissory note wasn't a promise to pay. Under the Federal Reserve Act, it was a security. It's still called a promissory note, but it's included in what's known as any notes. Let me show you something. Hold on. Yeah, we can get through that. Uh... Where's my new deal? There it is right there. Hold on. Let me let me show this to you. Not those. Pay attention to this because ain't nobody else telling y'all. Upon deposit with the Treasury of the United States or of any direct obligation of the United States or any notes, any notes, any, 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 any notes. So your promissory note is not a simple promissory note anymore. When you give it to the local federal, pay attention, it has to be given to the local Federal Reserve agent. Along with the application, operating circular number 10, appendix number 3. Don't worry about the operating circular. Worry about the any Federal Reserve agent part. That's the most important part. When it is delivered to the local Federal Reserve agent, it is not a promise to pay. It's a security. Hold on. Hold Hold on. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see if I can prove it to you. Hey, professor, ladies and gentlemen, I've been yelling and screaming this stuff because all I did was go over the law and broke down the legalese and understood it. There's a professor. He did the same thing. He's over in Britain. 
He's saying the same thing I'm saying. Let's listen to the professor for a moment. Y'all don't mind? Uh, this is Professor Richard Dick, okay, William Vonner. Pronounced with a V, spelled with a W. W-E-R-N-E-R. -E You'll hear the pronunciation in a moment. Hold on. Richard Vonner. Richard, when you think about inequality, inequality in the UK, and it's a hot topic, and you think about, as you'd like the banking sector to be uh, decentralised, flatter structure, more resilient, how do you begin to uh, talk to the public or the political class about achieving those goals? Essentially, you know, if, if, if um, we want to produce something, we need... That's his name, people. Go look him up on YouTube. He's got several videos, including a channel. He will explain this stuff to you. So you won't be hearing it out of my mouth only. And no, I have not listened to him in the past. He's just saying the same thing. And I'm saying to you all so that you understand that I know what I'm doing, know what I'm talking about. If I'm saying this stuff and I didn't get it from anybody else and I had to get it on my own and I understand it. And then I have a professor saying the same exact thing that should tell you something. I apologize. So there's a role for banks in almost everything that's happening in the economy. But what exactly is that role? I just quickly, I'd like to reflect on that. Banks are being thought of as intermediaries, but this are is they? not really what's happening. Banks, what, what are they then? The creators of the money supply. Okay, hold on now. He just, what? What the, did you just say? Okay, that's what that look is right there. Okay, they are the creators of the money supply. That's all the Federal Reserve is, people. Pay attention. Go look at their role. They maintain and monitor the monetary system in the United States. The creators of the money supply. Exactly the same thing. Now, hold on. There's another guy right over here. We're going to point out some things about him in a moment. So you're firmly of the view that banks create money out of thin air. Yes, well, I, I produced the first empirical studies to prove that. Um... Ladies and gentlemen, can somebody find that first empirical study that Professor William Vaughn did on the fact of how banks operate? Okay, let me tell y'all, because he, he, this is the question he answers. Hold on. Sort of as intermediaries, but this are is they? not really what's happening. Banks, what, what are they then? The creators of the money supply. So you're firmly of the view that banks create money out of thin air? Yes, well, I, I produced... Hold on now. The courts, the courts call it vapor money. They say it's a sovereign citizen thing. Uh, professor, you know you're a sovereign citizen, right? For talking about this stuff like this, you're talking about vapor money. Money just created out of thin air. He said that. He said thin air. Hold on now. The first empirical studies to prove that um, in the 5,000-year history. First empirical study in the 5,000-year history of banks. See, he went all the way back. I didn't go all the way back. I ain't going all the way back. I ain't a professor. I'm not doing all that type of study. No, no, no. I said I was going to focus on the March 9, 1933 Act because it changed the Banking Act. It was called the National Emergency Economic Banking Relief Act. That's when everything changed. So that's where I was going to start. And I was going to start and I was going to keep going and going and going. And then I said I was going to help you all out. I did my job. I did my job. Can nobody fault me? Well, I can fault you, mother. Shut up. Hold on. Free of banking. Banks are thought of as uh, deposit taking institutions that lend money. The legal reality is banks don't take deposits and banks don't lend money. Now, see that right there? Now, that's that. Pay attention. See that, that, that right there? Some people would say, oh, that right there is him telling him to be quiet. Don't be saying this. Because you are, you, the Illuminati. And I'm not saying nothing like that. Hold on. I want you to look at his look. Don't look at his fingers. Look at his look. He just said banks don't lend money. Okay, let's play it again so you can hear what Professor is saying. Institutions that lend money. The legal reality is banks don't take deposits and banks don't lend money. Banks don't take deposits and banks don't lend money. What the f is he talking about? That man must be crazy. I went and deposited money in the bank just yesterday. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to hear what he's saying.
because he is telling the truth. He's going to talk about promissory notes in a second. So what is a deposit? A deposit is not actually a deposit. It's not a bailment. It's not held in custody. Hold on. You just hear him say a deposit is not really a deposit. And I just told you that a promissory note is not really a promissory note when delivered to the local Federal Reserve agent. Stop going by the words with the Federal Reserve Act. They change the meanings, people. Promissory note is nothing but a financial instrument, a commercial piece of paper, an eligible piece of paper. It's a financial instrument. It's a security. It's a collateral. It is so many things. A deposit, it is not. When you deliver it to the local Federal Reserve agent, the act says that it's a deposit, but it's actually a delivery. Now watch what he says now. Um, at law, the word deposit is meaningless. The law courts and various judgments have made it very clear if you give your money to a bank, even though it's called a deposit, this money is simply a loan to the bank. That's true. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now you gonna speak? Hold on. Did y'all hear what he just said? Say that again, Professor. If you give your money to a bank, even though it's called a deposit, this money is simply a loan to the bank. That's true. Yeah. So there is no such thing as a deposit. So you, so you loaned your promissory note to the bank. Hold on. Let's make sure you understand this. That's what ChatGPT is proving right now. Hold on. This is loans in to the bank. Name, then. So mm. banks borrow from the public. Okay, so that much we've established. What but you guys already know that. They borrow from us. You think it's a secret account. No, they're not borrowing from your secret account. This is what they're borrowing from. Those of you who think you got these little secret accounts, you do have a TDA account. You do have an account with the Treasury, and you do have an account with Social Security Administration. It's called Social Security Trust Fund. That's what your account number is for. When you receive a Treasury check, it has your account number on there. So you do have an account with them, so don't let them try to convince you otherwise, because that's a lie. You do have an account with them. Okay, but let's go on, because we're not talking about that. We need to show y'all something, okay? Because, Professor, now nah, I forgot what I was going to tell y'all. I got to play that again. Hold on. Yeah, I got to play it again. Sorry about that, y'all. Went off on the tip. So mm. banks borrow from the public. Okay, so that much we've established. What about lending? Surely they're lending money. Um, no, they don't. Banks don't lend money. Banks, again, at law, it's very clear, they're in the business of purchasing securities. Okay, you heard what he said. The banks purchase securities. Pay attention. Now, I remember what I was going to say. I want to take you all right on. Uh-oh, not that, that way. I want to take you all, all the way down here. All the way down here. Got two more pages. That's one page. and Right here. Under the new law, the money is issued to the banks. In return for government obligations, which are bills of exchange, drafts, notes, bankers' acceptances, and our trade acceptances and bankers' acceptances. The money is worth one hundred cents on the dollar because it's backed by the credit, credit, credit of the nation. Each one of you have credit. Every single one of you have credit. That's why you've heard people like me talk about credit, 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 credit. Go and create credit. You can create credit. You don't realize it. You don't automatically have unlimited credit. Pay attention. But you can add to your credit. You've heard people say that you can add to your account. You can add to your credit and that's to your credit. Okay. You can add to your credit people. Told you $400 billion per defendant. You can add to your credit. All right, let's continue. It will represent a mortgage on all the homes and all the other property of the people of the nation of all of the people in the nation, all of the people in the nation, including those who are coming over here, whom you guys are calling illegal. There's nothing illegal about them. If you don't believe me, go back and read Ellis Island. Bring us your poor. Br br bring us your poor. And so why are you, excuse me, why are some of you complaining about the fact that people are taking that literally and they're bringing the poor? Mm-hmm. That's what I thought. Ain't got nothing to say, huh? Ellis Island. Y'all know y'all love y'all some Ellis Island. Bring us your poor, your fable, your fame, your lame, your, and people are bringing them. So how y'all going to call them illegal when you gave them the offer and they accepted your offer? You gave them an invitation and they accepted your invitation. Hey, Griff. Hey, boy. 
sorry, dogs looking at me. They're hearing my voice, so they I'm a I gotta go out there and talk to them in a minute. All right, now that's just so that we make sure y'all understand what's going on. That the banks are receiving a security. Now, remember we talked. Wait, hold on. Y'all don't y'all don't believe me. I know y'all don't. We got two more pages. Got this one and this one. Congress has made provisions. We have provisioned or provided that any direct obligation of the United States or any notes, drafts, bills of exchange, or bankers' acceptances acquired by the Federal Reserve Bank. See, it has to be deposited with the Federal Reserve Bank. Remember, there is no such word as deposit in banking. Not under the Federal Reserve Act. It doesn't mean deposit. So just focus. It doesn't mean deposit. But he says, it says, it says, acquired by the Federal Reserve Bank's may be deposited with the treasury not you depositing with the treasury pay attention but them depositing it with the treasury or with the local federal reserve agents and upon these securities so pay attention your promissory note when delivered to the bank is a security they are purchasing your securities now hold on just so that you guys hear it, because, Professor, could you tell this to them? Because they don't understand. They don't believe me when I talk. Um, no, they don't. Banks don't lend money. Banks, again, at law, it's very clear, they're in the business of purchasing securities. That's it. So you say, okay, don't you know, confuse me with all that legalese. No. I want a I, loan. I want a loan. Yeah. Fine. Here's the loan contract. Here's the offer letter, and you sign. At law, it's very clear. You have issued a security, namely a promissory note. And the hold on, haven't I been saying that to you guys? Haven't I said that? Didn't I do a song about that? Before I even heard the professor talk about it, I've been telling this to you guys. This is a professor, people. This is his job. This is what he studies. When you listen to some of his. Uh, YouTube, you'll see that he's on so many boards and he's been on so many commissions. This is a renowned professor. Tell him, professor, we're going to let him talk to y'all one more time because let him hit it at one more time. Because they rushed it out and I brought it in. Tony, Tony, Tony. What'd you do, Tony? You did it again? Hold on. Namely, a promissory note, and the bank is going to purchase that. That's what's happening. Put at it law. in layman's terms. What does that mean? It means that um, what the bank is doing is very different from what it presents to the public that it's doing. How does this fit together? So you say, fine, the bank purchases my promissory note, but how do I get my money? I want, you know, it's a I loan. Want I want my 200 money. grand. Right? I don't care about the details. I want now remember, he's about to tell you why I am challenging funding. Because there has to be consideration. So if they want to try to foreclose on you, these are the things you are challenging, people. Hold on. Want the money? The bank will say, "Well, you'll find it in your account with us." That would be technically correct. If they say, "We'll transfer it to your account," that's wrong because no money is transferred at all it's already from in the bank. anywhere inside the bank or outside the bank. Why? Because what we call a deposit is simply the bank's record of its debt to the public. Now, it also owes you money, and its record of the money it owes you is what you think you're getting as money. It's all. a liability for them. That's why they're trying to get it off their books. Pay attention, because they owe you money. And as long as you keep coming in as the debtor, and don't sit up there, I'm the creditor and all that stuff, unless you can prove it. And you can't prove it because you don't know enough. All it is. And that is how the banks create the money supply. The money supply consists to 97% of bank deposits. And these are created out of nothing by banks when they lend. Because Did you hear them? They can't use, by law, fractional reserve banking to lend money. They cannot do that. Fractional reserve banking is not money. It is not authorized in law. There is no law authorizing the creation of fractional reserve banking, which is your vapor money, which is your creating of money out of thin air. 
Fractional reserve banking is unconstitutional. It is not mandated by the Constitution, and that's why you are having your cases thrown out because they can't let this come out to the public because then that would evidence the fact that we are not in a deficit. The banks are in a deficit. We don't owe them anything. They are the ones who owe themselves something. Here's the thing, people. You got to pay attention. Fractional reserve banking is the thing that has everybody poor. Just that simple. That's the money out of thin air. That's your vapor money. They can't lend factional reserve banking, which is why you challenge the original deposit, the actual consideration, the actual loan. Where did you deposit the money? What account? How was I associated with that account? Where did I acknowledge receipt of those funds? Because if you don't have that, then you don't have a claim, homie. Where did the funds come from? Show me the account it came from. I want a complete history. I want an audit, homie. That's what you're doing. That's what the evidentiary hearing is for that we talked about at the beginning of this video. Richard, tell them one more time. They invent fictitious customer deposits. Why? They simply... Hold on. That's what Wells Fargo was doing and the other banks were doing when they were creating these accounts in people's names. They create fictitious deposits, fictitious accounts in your name. They do it all the time. The ones whom you find out about, that's because some person then stumbled on it and whistle blew, but you don't see anything ever happening to them. <laughs> Wait a minute. The government fines the bank. They give them a fine. They create money out of thin air. What type of fine are you going to give them? I apologize. I, I, I do apologize because people haven't been picking up on this. If the banks can do fractional reserve banking and you fine them, $300 billion, and all they have to do is take that fine, re take it, and document that fine on their records, create a deposit of that amount, and then fractional reserve bank that amount 90%, then what are you doing? You ain't did nothing. We ain't really doing nothing. Nothing. Okay? You ain't did nothing. So finding them, whenever you hear about a bank being fined, do not go for that. That's why our suit says the $400 billion times 150 cannot come from fractional reserve banking. Must come from actual assets. Go and read the suit, people. I'm trying to tell you this is not no bubblegum lawsuit. I'm not going in this blind or I don't know what we're doing. I just filed it because I just I heard it would be something nice. I just wanted people to see and recognize who I was because I so lonely. Whatever. One more again. E state slightly incorrectly in accounting terms. What is an accounts payable liability arising from the loan contract having purchased your promissory note as a customer deposit, but nobody has deposited any money. Wait, hold I on. I wonder how the FCA hold deals on. with this because in hold the on. what is an accounts payable liability arising from the loan contract having what? what is an accounts payable liability? What, what is, is an account accounts payable, payable liability? liability? What is an accounts payable liability? What is an account payable liability, ladies and gentlemen? That's what they put on their records. That's their book. That's their double entry bookkeeping. That's what they've created. Hold on arising from the loan contract having purchased your promissory note as a customer deposit but nobody has deposited any money i wonder how the fca deals with this because in the financial sector you're supposed to not mislead your customer he's part of the fca okay uh what is it called federal consumer agency he's part of the fca but that's why he did that little Illuminati symbol tell him you, you, you're saying too much, but now he's intrigued because he's saying things he knows part of it, but he's picking up on so much that he's learning something. You can see that they're both learning something because their posture has changed. At first, they were cynical. At when you go and listen to the beginning of this, this guy is cynical. He wants to treat him as you create money out there, they vapor money. Okay, he wants to be cynical. But he's not being cynical anymore. See, pay attention to his hands now. He's now paying attention. 
He's now, you got my attention. That's their demeanor. That's their posture. He's now, I'm in control of this conversation. I got you. Okay. Just all you got to do is pay attention. Um, anyway, I, so, I, I, I don't know the answer. So the look, look, I don't know the answer. <laughs> do you see this? Okay. They're deferring to him because he knows more than they do about the subject. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, when you get a chance, go look it up. Uh, that's the William Varner interview. It is 11 minutes and 14 seconds long. That's how you'll find it. All right. Now, remember, we got into this because you needed to know that a promissory note is a negotiable instrument under U.S. law, detailing their enforcement and transferability. The courts acknowledge that promissory notes, when properly endorsed, function as negotiable instruments akin to financial instruments. What I want you to do is pay attention to this. When you sign your promissory note, what you don't realize is that's called a blank endorsement. That is a proper endorsement under law. That's why it's a financial instrument because it has an endorsement. The endorsement was it was signed in blank. Okay, just got to understand signed in blank. You can find that under the UCC. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's enough. I, hey, I could sit here and talk about this stuff all day, but it's 844. I've been up since 5 o'clock this morning. So we, we've had enough. I mean, literally, I, I've had enough. I've been up way too long. And it's time for me to go and watch my little TV show to wind down and get on out of here. All right? Take care, everybody. We'll talk to you next time.